Audio Content Lab. Audio Content Lab. I am a scientist, so I want to start with an experiment, but I need your help. So everybody pay attention, wake up. I'm going to sing the first line of a song. You're going to sing the next line. Ready? Put your books down, pay attention. Ready? I don't want to grow up. Good. Next one. My baloney has a first name. OK, last one. This should be really easy for all of you. Like a good neighbor. Any agents? OK, no agents have appeared. <clears throat> Those songs are all indelibly stuck in our heads. We can thank Barry Manilow for that last one. He wrote it the year I was born. So we have all clearly grown up with advertising in our lives. You can hear them, but we can't. Earworms, jingles, small bits of song stuck in your head, rattling around in a loop like loose change in a dryer. How does music do that? Why does music do that? And as marketers, if we want to beguile and enchant our audience and increase brand memorability, why is it that the jingle is deemed tacky and out of touch, but we dive head first into the latest buzzword rather than thinking with our own earworm-infested brains about how to harness the power of sound and branding or our own marketing. Today we're talking about marketing, music, and brand science, first with an article from eConsultancy.com, and then we talk to Ethan Decker, I'm president and founder of Applied Brand Science, about brands and audio and how marketers can increase memorability and make the right kind of noise in their marketplace. And then Dr. Decker takes his chances in our interactive sound quiz. It sounds like marketing. marketing. It sounds like marketing. Welcome to Sounds Like Marketing, the audio content marketing podcast that's here to dial businesses and brands into the importance of sound. I'm Jake Sanders, joined by Paul Julius. The article today is from eConsultancy.com. It's entitled Science of Sound How Music Makes Advertising More Memorable by Nikki Gillian. Um, Paul, you found this article. Why don't you introduce it and, and provide your thoughts on it? So I wanted to find a simple explanation of the mechanics that are at play here, like, like how jingles work and why they work. Hmm. Um, and you and I, you know, we go deep on this sometimes too far, mm -hmm. um, talking about like key changes and stuff like that. So I really sure. wanted to get something that was just like a simple, solid explanation. Um, that's a good spring point here. And, and I think I found it. So check this out. Yep. She says, we got all those songs that remind us of a certain place or time in our lives. And this is because in order to process music, studies show that we use the same parts of the brain that are also responsible for emotion and memory. Because of the emotional response elicited from a piece of music, which can be either positive or negative, depending on the context of the sound, uh, the associated memory tends to be strong. So there's my explanation. But. This goes on to illustrate some other ways that, that sound and jingles can work for brands. So she, she also brings up driving a story. So while music on its own can be a powerful tool, it becomes far more effective when it highlights or corresponds uh, to a story or a narrative arc. Hmm. There's also art. Yeah. So like um, there's a great example in there um, where they use the, um, the balls, the bouncing balls, the Sony bouncing balls ad. Oh, my so gosh. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. and, 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 and I, I thought that was like, there was something really pointless about that ad, <laughs> yeah. but I was really, and oddly you, I was trying to put together a story, a narrative for the craziness of this ad. There's just all these bouncy balls, but the Jose Gonzalez track that's playing is so, so emotive. And I think that really, um, hits on that next point that you have here, the artist influence. Yeah. Like without yeah. the Jose Gonzalez track, that, that bouncy ball it's, thing doesn't quite work. It's weird. I mean, it's, it's kind of weird in the same way that Ikea releasing a hundred cats into one of their stores at night is man. Weird. I love that. Oh <sighs> yeah, totally. But anyway, okay. So second point, <laughs> artist influence, as you expertly led us to, this brings us to another factor that can increase the memorableness of music and advertising is the artists or musician themselves. 
Celebrity or quote unquote expert influence is of course a factor here with adverts featuring a well-known song or artist being able to draw from existing popularity. Mm -hmm. Uh, Example in here is when Microsoft threw probably billion, you know, multi-million dollars at the Rolling Stones for, to use Start Me Up. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody, you know, everyone knows, is at least somewhat familiar with that song. It, you know, you're, you're kind of jumping onto someone's coattails there. But Huge. I, I mean, it works. It works. Yeah, and um, Lily Allen is, is referenced in there, too, the John Lewis in the, sure. in the UK Christmas advertisements. Um, yeah. I, Borrowing that sound, borrowing that touch. I mean, really, there's there's so many examples of you know people using current artists' work to to sell something. I mean, mm-hmm. honestly, um, I, I think that's kind of a way that some bands get exposure now is through commercials. Um, which mm-hmm. brings to the last one is brand creation. This is the last point in the article. Many advertisers specifically choose existing songs from artists they want to feature, like we just said. Um, however, others choose a strategy of deliberately creating music for new advertisements. And this often involves a mention of the brand in some way or is more directly associated with the brand's product or service. Kind of like a jingle, um, but it's, it's, it's a little bit longer. It's a little bit deeper. And I think, and, and you can speak to this better than I can really, mm. but, but you're, you're, you have a different goal when you're writing a jingle versus a, a branded um, piece of music, like a composition, right? It seems like it's a hybrid of both of them. You know, they're, they're mentioning Justin Timberlake, um, yeah. you know, recording a version of the brand song. So it isn't quite using someone else's song. So it's not like mu- music supervision. Right. Uh, then they, they, they cite that Oreo used the guy from Owl City to sing an original song. Wonderfilled. Ah, I can't handle that. But th- I bet it was good. <laughs> Well, I mean, they, maybe they, we won't um, get into taste, um, but they the, do. Who's the, M- who's the MC that Oreo got though? That's in there that, that wrapped out that easy, you know, the, the Oreo commercial for everybody staying at home. Wiz Khalifa. Wiz Khalifa. Thank you. Yes. You're talking about Wiz Khalifa. So I Wiz am, Khalifa yes. wrapped out all the ingredients in an Oreo. No, no, no. He, he, <laughs> he just was talking about like, let's stay home and enjoy Oreos with family, but he was just rapping about cookies through this whole commercial. You know, it wasn't like he was using an existing song. That's amazing. And in the last example they give, this article is a little bit old, but it's the dumb ways to die, um, which was in us, which was in Australia, massively successful, cited as a marketing, a success story sung by Tangerine Kitty, a folk singer there. Um, but very iconic. Um, over time, it's become just sort of its own thing. Yeah. Uh, hopefully people are not dying anymore on those train tracks. We should probably oh. check in with that. Or write a, someone needs to write another a follow-up song. <laughs> Whoops. We got the research wrong. We read the brief. It was upside down. <laughs> We're so sorry. Anyway, so, yeah, we'll get McKinsey on the phone. See if they can co- <laughs> consult us out of this hole. We need more musicians. Hire an orchestra. Didn't How work. many musicians do we have on staff? <laughs> too, ma- too many. Oh, okay. You're right, All actually. Right, so my points. Here's what I got out of this article. There's, I, I got two things. Number Go, one, yeah, yeah. Of course we process sound differently. I mean, when I thought about this, it makes a lot of sense. For most of our evolutionary history, being able to separate danger sounds from everything else or being mm. understand... Mm how the tone around you changed yes. could literally be life or death. Yes. I mean, we are wired like this on purpose. We process it differently on purpose. So mm-hmm. that's a key point. And number two, just because it has the potential to work and you know, there are several incredibly successful ads used as examples in the article. It doesn't mean it happens every time or even some of the time. And look at it this way. If a successful jingle is memorable, then an unsuccessful one is unmemorable. And I really think this is an important distinction Mm. to make. It's not that people didn't like it, but it's that they didn't remember it. I mean, there's been numerous successful ads or jingles or whatever that people had a negative response to, but still performed really well. Mm. So that's the thing. Like, think about, you know, even if you just think about how, you know, personally you process music, some stuff you really remember. I remember all the words that, you know, mm-hmm. um, some stuff you just don't, or you did for a little while. Oh, I remember that song, but I haven't thought of it until the next time I heard of it. So, mm-hmm. um, 
being sticky like that, mm. not an easy trick. A lot of people try it and, and it just doesn't always work out. Well, and, and you, you bring up a really, really good point that's, that's echoed in the interview with Dr. Ethan Decker, where he, he's working with clients and maybe has gone through each of these iterations that, that Nikki's talking about in here, working with an existing song, trying to create a marketing campaign around that, but then also coming up with new things or using existing um, audio signatures. I love the point of sound being this survival mechanism because that is the truth of the reason why it's so sticky is because it activates from that survival level. You have to listen to sound and interpret it and say, is that dangerous? And then if there's, if there's a couple intervals, you say, is this music? And then if there's a rhythm, you start setting your body to it. And then you say, have I heard this before? And then you start setting your expectations. And this all happens in parallel processing, you know, on a neuroscientific level. Like that's how your brain interprets sound. And it starts because you wonder if it's a, if it's a rustling in the grass or a tiger. You know, I think you're, you're bringing up a really, really good point and that's why it's sticky, but how do you get it sticky? Yeah. Are, are you choosing the right influencers? And now that you look at TikTok, how many of those songs are working, those new songs, and how many of those old songs are working, making new moments? You know, I think we, we cover that. Um, we talk about all of these different iterations and ways that brands could and can bring sound into their marketing. Uh, in in the interview with Ethan, so we should we should roll to it. Let's go check it out. Let's go. And now an interview with. I'm Ethan Decker. I'm president and founder of Applied Brand Science. Ethan, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So brand science, brand scientists, uh, uh, speak on this. Can you give us a brief rundown as it applies to marketing and how you found yourself in the nexus? Sure. Uh, well, I was going to do brand science, but people don't like brand. So uh, instead, I figured I would focus on branding. Uh, actually, the truth is I'm a scientist by training. I got a PhD a long time ago in ecology and evolution and yet could never shake the, the cultural bug and the creative bug that had bitten me uh, before that. So I uh, fell kind of backwards into marketing and advertising, market research, things like that, and then became a brand strategist. So thinking on that brand strategy, brand science, it seems like even the concept brand, people don't like it. You're talking about people don't like it. Marketers love it, um, but it seems right. like it's out of reach for for small businesses, like we read these case studies about these giant brands, and then you hear brand right. science and brand planning and brand strategy. Why would a small business care about this stuff? Like, how, how is this relatable to the Joe and Jill marketer? The small small businesses need it just as much as the big ones because your brand is really quite simply your brand is really quite simply your reputation. It's what you're known for. It's who you rub elbows with, you know, who you're associated with as a company or a product or a person. And it's, uh, it's how people find you in the marketplace and in the world. So even the, the, the smallest brands like my own applied brand science, people need to know, well, what the hell are you? Who are you actually for? And how do I put you in my, my brain, my world of products or services or people that I might need or want. Mm. So, so, and, and if you're talking about brand ing, is it encapsulated in just the messaging or is, is it just a, you know, the frequency just to talk about how a small business could do this is, is just posting a bunch on social media going to get it done? I mean, how, how do you establish a brand? It's a connect. It's a combination of of what you say and, of course, whether people hear it at all. And not just what you say, very much what you do, because most people don't hear about most brands. Mm. I could probably name fifty brands, and you might have heard of three of them. 
there are, what is it, 35,000 products in the average grocery store now. And something like uh, 15,000 new product launches every single year. Now, some of these are for established brands, like, you know, Oreo is going to launch another Oreo, not surprisingly. But there will be a whole bunch of small cookies and small crackers and pita crisps that are, are coming up. And uh, you might have never heard of them. So even the small brands need to kind of uh, establish what they're about and let people know that they exist at all. And so that's branding. It's a lot more than just your logo. It's a lot more than just a tagline. It's everything you do. It's which stores you actually show up in. Are you at Whole Foods or are you at, in Colorado here, we've got King Supers. So, you know, if you're at Whole Foods, it says one thing about you. If you're in King Supers, it might say a slightly different thing about you. All so, that's branding. And so what's the, what's the science part of this? Because I've had a lot of meetings with, um, you know, small business owners or, you know, people, particularly a lot of work in like service industry and stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and you mentioned like logo, but, but there's more to it, right? I mean, you're saying like you have to establish what, what's the best way for a company or a, a business to kind of look at this from a scientific perspective instead mm -hmm. of just saying, oh, let me go on Fiverr and, you know, boom, you're my logo and we're <laughs> going to go with these colors and that's right. It. Because you know that's well, the way to do it, and that's, that's maybe that's the most financially a secure way to do it. We only spent thirty five bucks on this logo. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Low risk. Low risk. Yeah, right. On the one hand, the science piece is really the question of what's true and what's just hype. I've been in branding now and, and advertising for almost twenty years, and there are lots of fads. Uh, a while ago, this major ad agency called Saatchi and Saatchi, the head of that. Uh, wrote a book called Love Marks. The notion was there are some brands out there which you just love so much they become a love mark, like Absolute Vodka or Apple. And it's actually kind of bogus. It's kind of bullshit. I can, I can curse on this, right? Yeah, you can go. Of course. Okay. So so uh, as, as a scientist by training, even though I've got, you know, musical theaters and all kinds of uh, creative stuff in my background, as a, as a trained scientist, I wanted to know, well, what's the shit and what's the shinola? What's the fact and what's the fiction? As a young or small company, you're going to be told by maybe Gary Vaynerchuk that all the old rules of marketing are dead. It's all about influence and social. Or you're going to be told by the, the guy I told you about the Love Marks book who says it's all about creating love and passion with your fans. So you're going to hear a lot of different theories. So the science piece is, well, what's true? And, and how many of the old rules from 50 or 100 years ago still apply and how many of them don't? So that's why I dig through the, the research and the actual science to figure that piece out. And that's relevant whether you're, you're Pillsbury and you've got some of the biggest brands in grocery or whether you're you know, um, uh, Susan's Pita Chips from Boulder. And you're trying to launch your first ever retail. And, and so there's a there's a there's a, a sci the scientific aspect of this. I mean, you're testing hypothesis. Are you saying, hey, there's if we do this, we expect to see this happen, and if it doesn't, that means this. I mean, because I'm really I'm yep. super interested in that kind of approach because it's it's kind of it's a little more black and white than people just telling me, well, what do you feel? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, there are two sides of it. I, I was talking to someone about this recently. There's certainly that research side and you got to test. You got to test uh, your your headlines. You got to test your email uh, subject lines because some will get much better open rates than others. Uh, you got to test your website layouts and things like that. You got to test your products, get them in the market and see if people like them, because it's really hard for us to predict the particulars of which pita chip will do best or which email subject line will do best. So the research piece, I'm totally with you. On the other hand, there are these principles that are timeless, that are true, just like the laws of gravity and the laws of physics. And those principles, you don't have to test and retest to know that, that gravity is 9.8 meters per second, something or other like that. Uh, that's going to be the same everywhere. But a lot of people don't know what those principles are, those laws are. And that's the secret science, so to speak, that I really like to talk about because uh, it really helps, again, separate the shit from the Shinola. Well, and I think what you did, because we're starting this uh, this episode with 
your TED talk when you speak, uh, when you ask the audience to sing the, the rest of the mm-hmm. jingles, there is something about finishing a song. There's something about music. There's something about jingles. You must have done, I, and I love this TED Talk. Everyone has to go see it. The extensive research that goes into this, this anthropological stuff. What was, when you were researching this, what was something that surprised you about the connection between brands and sound? One thing that surprised me about the connection was, first of all, how visceral it is. How, how quickly sound can connect in your brain and, and stick. So sound is extremely sticky. I mean, uh, there are probably lots of brand sounds that you know of that without even, you know, if I say Duracell, the mm. copper top battery, dun, 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 you can probably hear that sound. Dun, dun. Yep. Right, right, right. There it is. Do, do, do. Uh, I worked with them. They call it the slam. And oh, like nice. the, top, the top of the battery slams on the rest of it. Do, do, do. Uh, so they're really sticky. And, uh, and then I worked with Domino's. And what was amazing about Domino's is they have a really, really strong tagline that really resonates with how they do marketing. But nobody knows it because they've never said it out loud in an ad. They only show it visually. So TV, there's a great example. Uh, you think of TV as a visual medium, but actually it's maybe more important as an audio medium because when people are, they've got the TV on, they're cooking, they're doing stuff, who knows, they're multi-screening. It's the sound of the commercial, which might matter even more than the visuals because you're looking at other stuff in your life. So Domino's, the ta- do you know the tagline? Have you heard it? So fresh and cheesy. <laughs> It's uh, that's so close. Pizza, wait, no, pizza redefined. Oh, this is how we pizza. This is (laughs) uh, uh, for everything else. There's Dominic's. No, (laughs) Um, when you're here, your family. Okay, (laughs) (laughs) you're in good hands with Dominic's. The so the, the tagline is, Oh, yes, we did. And it's it's the answer to a question Domino's keeps asking, which is, did Domino's just create a car with a pizza oven in it? Oh, yes, we did. Did Domino's just allow you to tweet an emoji of a pizza to Domino's and order directly from Twitter? Oh, yes, we did. So they do all these crazy, cool things that they talk about, but they never actually either asked or answered the question audibly. And that's why when I say Arby's, you can complete that. Yeah, because they do have the meats, and and they do. So and it is <laughs> is there? So whatever that meat is, <laughs> don't get in here, Paul. Don't start asking about the meats. He's the sorry. Upton Sinclair of the podcast. I'm sorry. He's yeah, always white gloving things. Arby's. He's like, mm, I don't like it. But you can hear it in Ving Rhames's voice, right? Oh, oh yeah, we have the meats, and oh, yeah. that audio brand is is enormous whereas Domino's, they never do the audio piece of that end line or that, that end phrase so you know it doesn't stick in your brain the same way i mean Domino's is doing great don't get me wrong so but speaking oh, yeah. to uh have you ever worked with someone in in an audio capacity or help somebody come up with a jingle or work on work on a pro uh, like a campaign that was around this i did didn't go so great. <laughs> well, then so now we like, have to hear about it, or can we? Oh, of course you can hear about it. Yeah, uh, it's a very funny story. I was working with Kellogg's, and uh, they were trying to get people re-excited about cereal because, you know, there are all these new breakfast foods and these right. breakfast bars, and Starbucks is starting to offer breakfast, and McCafe is ramping up. So they wanted to get people back into milk and cereal. And uh, I don't know. Do you know the the uh, musician G Love? And the special sauce. Oh yeah. There you go. G- yeah, G Love's got this weird little B side track called Milk and Cereal. And without any fanfare or any real effort, this thing has this weird little cult following on YouTube where people sing into their breakfast spoons and sing the milk and cereal song. And actually they don't sing it. They lip sync it. 
And these lip syncs have gotten a lot of views for being rando, nothing, little videos. And we're like, this is it. This is perfect. This is, you know, magic in a, in a teacup, mm -hmm. or actually a cereal bowl in this case. And we said, how about you just fan these flames and let people take this over and do this little copyable thing, just like the cup song from, uh, you know, Pitch Perfect, Anna Kendrick. Sure. You probably, right. Oh, yeah. Or, oh, yeah. or like any, any uh, commercial where people can copy it and do it themselves. So we said, let's make the milk and cereal song the next copyable kind of jingle. And instead, they turned it into kind of a really basic ad. They had someone else sing it. They had a montage of people happy in their kitchens and happy with their kids, but not that weird, goofy thing of a couple people like, you know, college boys singing into their spoons for this weird song. And here's a question, because what you're describing is Vine, is TikTok, mm -hmm. is this yep. lo-fi um, yep. sort of thing. People aren't making ads anymore, Ethan. They're making TikToks. Um, right. Is, what is that? Because there is something about this has to be lo-fi enough for us to believe that it's a genuine thing that we should care about. Do you, do you, do you kind of feel that? And, and as marketers, we, we don't want that. We, we need some polish. We need to put a, a wig on it or something. Right. Right. No, you're right. There, there is, there is a kind of, when it's lo-fi enough, you can believe it's real. I hate the word authentic because in marketing circles and these big companies, they spend weeks and years crafting their authenticity. <laughs> it's like, it's <laughs> so, so like um, a great example recently was that, um, that video of the guy on the skateboard with the Fleetwood Mac song. Yes. Yep. You know? And, and he was drinking cranberry juice. Mm -hmm. And so there was some conversation about, oh my God, this is a great viral moment. Yeah, but for who? Was it for the guy, the cranberry juice, or for TikTok? Or for, or for Fleetwood Mac, whose song it was? And, and then uh, actually TikTok turned it into a TV ad and they kind of did the same thing the Kellogg's did. They just made it a bit more cheesy instead of just letting that 30 seconds of weird bliss play out on your TV. Mm. And yeah, I think that the, the grittiness is, um, it lets people know it's a little more real. It is a little less polished. Not that polished is bad. Nike is probably the best at making polish great. I always took that, that TikTok ocean spray thing mm -hmm. that, uh, I, I almost felt like when I saw the ad they made, sorry, this is kind of off, off subject, but that, that it was done by their marketing department because they felt threatened. You know what I mean? They're like, look at <laughs> this guy, just random dude got more views than what we've been working on for a year or whatever. Yeah. You know what I yeah. mean? Um, and so they were like, well, we got to get in here and make it markety markety. Well, and, and, yep. and, and here's, here's the dichotomy that maybe I want to strike here is that you see that these things are cheap. It's cheap to make. Seems like people are just sort of making these things out of nowhere for no money. That's the mm -hmm. new authentic good stuff. So we don't really have to pay for that anymore. In fact, maybe right. we're overpaying for marketing and advertising. Do you right. know, you could easily talk yourself out of a, a job. I, I don't know. Yeah. It feels like, you know, oh, we, it's got to be really lo-fi. What do you mean? It's got to look cheap. Okay, so we don't need all these lights and all this, uh, you know, the drone. No, we don't need a drone. Mm -hmm. So the drone There's, footer, you know, the drone guy's out yeah. of a job. The green screen person, the reflector light person, the boom mic guy, gone. Get out, Carl. So hey. what's... <laughs> Poor Carl. Talk about it. I mean, I mean, it, it, there's a there's there's a thing that's saying, well, hey, these things look cheap, and that's what the kids like. It's a mix. I mean, first of all, that that last comment you you just said, that's what the kids like. I think that's where a lot of this gets tangled mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. a marketing is is a, insanely ageist and only wants to go after the kids, even though the kids are broke, the kids don't have jobs, the kids all have college debt. Uh, you know who's got all the money still is the boomers and the Xers. But advertising, especially in America, for the past 25 years has been youth obsessed. And great. So you want to go after the kids on TikTok and they'll buy a couple T-shirts, but they're not the ones buying refrigerators and, you know, refinancing their home and, and getting, you know, six mountain bikes. So 
yeah, there is there is this thing like that the the craft is seen sometimes as overblown and overdone. But again, it's horses for courses. What's your audience? What do you really need to connect with them? Sometimes you just need a lo-fi little video like, uh, yeah, that random dude, Nathan something, mm -hmm. uh, cruising down the street drinking ocean spray. Or sometimes you need a really, really epic, awesome spot that's fantastical and interesting. One of, the, one of my favorites is the Jean-Claude Van Damme epic split for the Volvo semi-trucks. Great. Mm. This mm -hmm. is from a while ago, but it was an epic ad. And they put Enya as the soundtrack, which was a stroke of genius. Mm -hmm. And it turns out, not only did everyone copy it, because it's insane to see you know, Jean-Claude Van Damme do a split between two semi-trucks um, with his feet on each of the, the side mirrors, but it was a product demo. It was showing you how precisely these semi-trucks could drive backwards. The trucks were driving backwards and staying precisely a Jean-Claude Van Damme apart. So I just loved it. And that's a major, major production, a shoot, the practice, the rehearsals, all that. There is a place for that, but it's horses for courses. So well, not everything is going to be lo-fi and cheap and, you know, just done uh, with a, a selfie stick. Right, right. Well, and so well, it's speaking towards that, you, you said Enya, which is a stroke of genius. And so now we're getting towards TikTok being this place where you can use whatever music Fleetwood Mac yep. didn't, didn't get, uh, maybe, maybe they have some transaction with TikTok to have their, uh, library available to the streaming platform, but right. there's this way, there's this now barrier that's just sort of been smashed down in between original music and, you know, using something that you can find. Like, mm -hmm. can you talk about, the power of, or what you've discovered around using existing music or writing a new piece of music. Like you had, you said you had music theater background. What mm -hmm. do you think of, you know, people using old stuff, redoing Shakespeare again, or coming up with a new play, like new music, speak on this music, speak on copyright. Can, do you think about this? Dr. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I do. It's a, uh, and, and this is a big, this is often a big question when it comes to advertising. Do you want to do something that's familiar and big? Like, let's get Bruno Mars. Right. I worked on Hershey. And they grabbed Bruno Mars for uh, one of their big candy bar launches. And you, you don't get much bigger at that point than Bruno. So it's familiar. It's exciting. This is the Pepsi playbook, right? Right. Get the biggest acts and get the biggest familiar songs. And f people like things that are familiar. That's why pop radio works on the other hand it's really great to do something new and different and original and uh it's hard because people don't quite know where it fits in their lives uh and it might be a dud uh jack conti is one half of a band called pomplamoose he and his wife um do really really fun silly music and great. their biggest hit is a, a cover song oh yeah uh, i think it's lady gaga they're covering telephone that's all um, they did was covers. I mean, you're speaking while, on a really yeah. you're speaking on a really interesting thing because a lot of bands make it in with a cover and disappear right. in the cover of darkness. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, <laughs> Alien Ant Farm. They did that. Mm -hmm. Annie, are you okay or whatever? You know, they did a cover of Michael Jackson yeah. or uh, you don't you don't hear any of them. You don't hear them anymore. Right. But right. it's interesting that all we are are covers. Because we want to drench ourselves in nostalgia. So, well, I mean, well, it's, it's a funny, go, but go not ahead. totally. I mean, people not like totally. the new as well. And they like, they, uh, uh, I think his name is uh, Raymond Lowy or Richard Lowy. Mm. He helped design like the, the Dreamliner and uh, uh, Pan Am. This is back in the 40s. Oh, he had wow. a principle, Maya, most advanced yet acceptable, which is to say, as far as you can push it, yet familiar. So how do you make the new familiar? And how do you make the familiar new? Uh, you you want to have things that kind of have a, an echo or a, a rhyme. They rhyme with the past. You don't, def, you don't want the exact song from the past. 
Like you don't want to go back and hear doo-wop from the 50s. You want to hear Lauryn Hill's version of doo-wop. Hmm. You don't want to hear, you know, classic 70s um, R&B. You want to hear um, Amy Winehouse's version of R&B. So it's like, it's, it's the past, but it's also updated. Yes. That's the sweet spot. There's yeah. definitely something there too. that. And I think one thing that struck me while we were talking about the, um, the, the ocean spray thing is that the flip side of it, one thing I've noticed recently because I've been watching a little more TV is the drug commercials. And, and I, 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 I hate, uh, that we advertise for drugs. Just want to say that yep. in the first place. Yep. But I'll tell you what, I mean, I know the trilogy song, you know, <laughs> right. It's, it's, it's catchy. It's, it's, yeah. I mean, I'm not happy that I have this earworm, but it's there. So there's a brand that has, I mean, they really nailed it. I think at least, I mean, it sticks to me and I don't want to talk to my doctor about their drug. <laughs> right. Uh, so, but, but there is that thing there. I mean, I think they've done that. It's almost the antithesis of that, you know, kind of lo-fi get it viral like that seems to me to be a very produced deliberate you know i i can just i can i can smell the focus groups that went into that like there's still that there you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah although you don't you don't need to be super hi-fi to have a sticky audio thing like that i think you're right that they they nailed it and they did get stuck in your brain and that's what a lot of branding is about is letting people know you exist, reminding them that you exist because it's going to be days or weeks before they go back to buy that category again. Sure. So you got to stick in their brain. But oh, here's, yeah. here's one you, I'm sure you've heard a, a million times that super lo-fi is um, you've got a friend in the diamond business. Mm -hmm. Sure. It's a Shane company. Now come in. Right. Shane company. There you go. We have 24 carat men's and women's engagement rings. We have 20, eight carat stone <laughs> you know you can hear it oh, and it's, it's super lo-fi but it's sticky so we, we've kind of talked about some a pretty broad range of you know you can do lo-fi you can do produced make something custom uh use something that exists out there maybe update it so there's a lot of different things here how do you think a brand like of any size or budgetary means like what's the best tactic or how can you take advantage of this sound relationship with marketing? I would say when you, when you think about your brand, which is really just, again, all the different elements of your company, your organization, it includes your people, it includes your product or service, it includes things like your website and your logo that you got from Fiverr, you, you should include as many different sensory elements as you can. Because... Again, your job is to be sticky enough that when your target audience goes from hearing or seeing you at some point to then, you know, lapsing and doing their life and living their life and raising their kids or exercising, and then they go back into the market to buy your category, mm. you want your brand to come back to their mind. Mm. And so the more sensory pieces, the more senses you can link to, the higher your chances that they'll even remember you exist. And then better yet, that they'll even think fondly enough of you to, to go check you out. Like, so sound is one of those. Oh my gosh. So, right? so ha have, have you found one of those senses to be most powerful um, when you've worked with a brand? Is, is, is just the visual element more powerful than auditory or smell, <laughs> scratch and sniff? Anybody? Uh, Smell is soup. Smells probably the most powerful, but it's really hard to do smell a vision. So, <laughs> so it's, it's you know it's, it's hard common. to plant it and it's hard to remind people. But but <laughs> when you do go into a grocery store, uh, like your your King Supers out here or your Hannaford back east, normally you walk in and you're inundated with one of three smells. Do you remember what they are? Fried chicken. Okay. Yep. The flowers. Meat. Flowers, yep. And I guess produce or uh, close. It's donuts. either uh, it's bakery. They often will wheel a whole, you know, rack of fresh baguettes yes, to the front door. I got it. Boom. Um, but they really try and prime you with smells. And so you walk in and either you're smelling rotisserie chickens 
or, or fried chicken or you're smelling flowers because the, fl- the floral department's right there. If you had to give people one takeaway from behavior, brand science, and marketing, what would it be? The one takeaway would be your customers are not your customers. They're just other people's customers that sometimes buy you. And then your job, therefore, is to be just memorable and just likable enough that they buy you a little more. Okay, so how can people find you online, Ethan? Appliedbrandscience.com. That's an easy one. I'm also on LinkedIn at E.H. Decker or on Twitter at E.H. Decker. Those are my main go-tos. Time for a sound quiz. Brought to you by SoundSnap.com. What is your favorite sound in the world? Mm. My favorite sound is probably Loon Song. The sound of a loon in the evening on the lakes in Maine. That's, and of course, it's tied up to all those other memories for me. But the sound of a loon singing is a beautiful thing. Uh, So, and that's, That's as soon as you said that, I immediately remembered camping with my dad in the Boundary Waters. And at night, you would hear these things. Yeah. Flip side, what is your least favorite sound? Ooh, I would say... It's a version of the nails on the chalkboard. It's when someone's fork skids across the plate Mm -hmm. and screeches, you know, that kind of ceramic squeal. Terrible. Hate it. Yeah. Hate it. Okay. So I just sent you the lightning round. Lightning round. Guess the sound. Okay. Let me pull it up here. Here we go. Okay. So we're going to play these for the audience uh and so you you just cue it up and then you guess what that first one is and the prize you get is a regular shirt we send you a shirt okay. just a regular shirt i'm a regular guy i like that okay here's the first sound ooh that's opening a can of pringles ooh so close it is a jar oh, it is a can of, of covered tennis balls no it's it's a spreadable it's something spreadable on bread uh that well then that would probably be uh, nutella yes <gasps> wow all right boom the applause goes through the roof okay there's that little one in the middle play that That's that's not the tennis ball can opening. No. Um, it's really small. Uh, Donald Trump washing his hands. <laughs> no, not that small. No. <laughs> <laughs> wow. We're going to put a rim shot there. Can I try it again? Yes, yes, yes. Try it one more time. Oh, it's something pouring. Yep. It's like uh, the pouring a beer. Oh my gosh, really close. It's hot milk foam. And that is a clue to the third and final sound. That has got to be a coffee grinder. An espresso machine. Yes, yes. Oh my God. Bam, bam. All right. We're going to pick out a shirt. It's going to be super regular and we're going to send it to you. Fantastic. Sounds Like Marketing is a production of Audio Content Lab. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you find your podcasts and follow Audio Content Lab for the latest in sound marketing advice.